And where is all this physical gold finally ending up, guys? They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault, or should I say Live from the Jungles of Costa Rica. Yes, I'm out of the vault. My name is Shane Moran, and I'll be your host. For this episode and from the entire Life from the Vault team worldwide, we want to really thank you for your continued support. And as you can imagine, the community keeps growing uh, thanks to you and thanks for sharing and, and, and spreading the word about this important channel here. There's a lot to talk about during these historic times and fear not because we have the one and only Andrew McGuire. He's in the house and we'll be talking gold today. And this is going to be an amazing episode. So fasten your seatbelt. You know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates you just can't get anywhere else. And I promise you, this episode will be no exception. And just before we get to Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire, uh, let's just remind everyone, hit that like, hit the share button. And if you want to be notified as these episodes go live, just click on that bell. And with that, let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Now, Andrew, for consistency and to put our questions in order, you know, uh, we usually start off by picking up the thread from our last market update, which was two weeks ago. And there are a ton of questions coming in right now. So can we just start off this uh, episode here with a quick review of what's gone on in the last two weeks? Absolutely, Shane. And I can see you're in the jungle there. A little bit of fun for you. And look, you know, we're going to talk about this jungle today, but you, you're in a jungle which I much prefer to be in, to be honest. But uh, yeah, let's let's get into it. And uh, Shane, it's, it, I must say, there are some lovely backdrops in some of our interviews. And if it's not a lovely tree and a lake, uh, it's the jungle. But anyway, guys, <laughs> let's let's get to the question. And that's a great question. I know that you've got it. Uh, you've kind of honed out a load of questions. So um, so look, when, when we talk about I'm going to start about talking about the bearish crosses. Now, please don't switch off here. A bearish cross uh, that drives the gold price and gold and silver price is simply because gold and silver are foreign exchange crosses. And if the dollar is rising, uh, the natural uh, the natural reaction to that is to sell or buy gold and silver, depending on whether the dollar is rising or falling. So, I mean, obviously, that's just the paper side of the market. But we've had two solid weeks of these bearish crosses, and it's been driving these speculative algos to tick for tick sell gold and silver futures. And of course, we're in the middle of summer here in liquid conditions. Most people are at the Hamptons. Desks are on skeleton staff. Um, so really, we're seeing a, an accentuated move, but it also helps us to look at the front prints. And we'll look at what to expect next week as the September COMEX futures positions roll right off the board, but into what are unprecedented, deeply backwardated conditions. We've talked about backwardation. It simply means that the futures market is cheaper than the cash price. Okay, so in September... It should be pretty much at par, par, but in December, it should be at a massive contango, a premium. So, in fact, what really has our attention is that overnight, now we're recording this on Wednesday, the 24th of August, overnight, December silver futures, not the September contract that's about to run out, the de December contract reverted into an unprecedented 5.4 cent discount to the spot cash market. Which, if you add in the carry costs for this contract um, to uh, to expire when it expires, adds it really equates to an arbitrable nine hundred dollar discount per contract to spot silver. And while market making insiders with a footprint in both the COMEX and the paper markets can profitably arbitrage this differential and do by design. Unless exempted, US-centric traders are forbidden from directly accessing this 10 times larger uh, silver foreign exchange market. That is by design. And we've talked about you know, me having to get rid of my clients in 2013 and how they siloed uh, US traders into the COMEX who have very little option but to trade anything but that. So what this is telegraphing is that due to this synthetic siloed effect, 
the blinkered spectre of Encomex silver pricing mechanism has completely broken away from the real wholesale delivery markets. Now, the divergence illustrates just how disconnected the price setting non-delivery Comex market is from reality. However, as, as we're going to see in a minute, speculators are the patsies here, with the house insiders Beckett betting for higher prices against them. And, and uh, we all know how it's going to work out uh, for the house in a situ situation like that. Now, we talked about the broken silver market chain, I think it was two months ago. It was a re around that long time ago. But over the last two weeks, these footprints are becoming impossible to hide. Now, and I think that is help, it's partly helped by the thin market conditions. Now, the largest delivery month of the year centers on this new upcoming December Silver Futures contract, which rolls into a front month contract next Tuesday. OK, so uh, just less than a week ago, a week to go. It then uh, goes into delivery at the end of November. Now, what we've never seen before and what tells us a massive short squeeze is coming in COMEX price silver is that when accounting for three months of storage costs uh, for insurance, carry costs, um, uh, all the costs associated with holding a contract from the end of August to uh, to really the 30th of November, this contract should ordinarily be trading at a plus 30 cent, if not more, premium to cash silver. Obviously, you've got to factor these carry costs in. But instead of commanding a premium, which has said the largest contract of the year is already trading at an unprecedented five, nearly a 5.5 cent discount price lower than the immediately deliverable cash silver price. Now, let's, let's just take that in for one second, because people don't think about what this means. There is a massive implications here, and they're extremely unappreciated. And of course, stackers do understand this because they, they understand what the physical market is doing and that there is a solid bid under physical gold, silver. Now, add in the forward carry costs to December, as I say, that's about a $900 discount per contract, which is undoubtedly being profitably arbitraged by risk-free, completely risk-free by the house market managers exposed to the cash delivery markets to profit at the expense of these blinkered specs carrying the load. Now, I don't feel sorry for them because even though they're siloed, because they are actually providing, they are the problem. Uh, however, this leaves a problem that's never been experienced from for, before in the entire history of the COMEX. The primary rationale for the existence of a regulated gold and silver futures market is to provide a legitimate hedging mechanism uh, for a range of market participants and uh, from physical holders, uh, if you're long spot uh, or a forward contract. Um, and of course, these contracts are relied on by refiners, uh, producers, and ultimately, this leads into the leveraged multi-billion dollar derivative bets identified in the OCC report, the Office of the Comptroller report that we've talked about multiple times. Now, look, it's not rocket science to discern that with an already nearly 5.5 cent discount to spot and no 30 cent premium or contango to anchor your hedges onto, at inception, this poses the institutional market a negative carry cost, cost of about $1,750 per contract. I mean, worse, as a Swiss refiner told me this week, given this paper discount is counter to very strong physical demand, this means there is a high, high risk that this negative correlation reverts. And I mean, refiners are shaking their heads. Something has to give here because it is so blatantly counterintuitive. So as a result, this means that the December COMEX futures are off the menu now, altogether as a hedging tool. Now, off the menu, that is for everyone but the naked short speculators, siloed inside the COMEX future markets. And the COMEX tail, what we're saying here, has wagged the spot physical dog just that once too often. Andrew, that, that's absolutely incredible. Now, what do you think is going to happen then in the silver market? 
Yeah, for, for silver, unless prices are allowed to rise significantly, and I don't mean just a few dollars, unless this real supply demand fundamentals are reflected in the price setting COMEX, then this is the end of the COMEX as an institutional tool. I mean, the implications of that are enormous. And we've already evidenced COMEX liquidity flowing out into more efficient physical hedging options. Uh, we'll look at that more in a second. But in fact, the risk-free natural arbitrage that market-making insiders are capitalizing on by bilaterally settling these exchange for futures, silver futures into a T plus two deliverable spot contract, i.e. the EFP is simply a mechanism where you can take a COMEX contract, you can transport it into, um, the, uh, into the uh, over-the-counter market, and it's a bilaterally settled uh, ability to T plus two, in other words, a two-day delivery on the futures market, on, on the spot market. And then what you're doing there, a refiner would do that, other people would do that. You'd lock in a physical price. But you're not going to do this at these bastardized prices. There's no other word for it. And already it's being capitalized on by large Indian and Chinese buyers. So while traders are hoodwinked into believing the COMEX price is the only price, a chasm has been ripped open and the silver hedging mechanisms are migrating to competing physical exchanges. Now, much like when the LME and the nickel, and the nickel blowout ha happened, once trust is lost, liquidity will find another home. And that is exactly what's happening now, Shane. Well, you know, Andrew, we often tell our uh, community that life from the vault brings you information that you just can't get anywhere else. And we're seeing that now. Now, Andrew, just before we started recording, you had mentioned uh, that Russia is creating its own competing LBMA uh, brand. Can you elaborate on that for our, for our community? Yeah, I mean, this is Shane, yeah, this is a perfect timing for Russia as well. Announcing its plan to create its own international standard for the precious metals markets. Um, and and they, they've called it, it's being called the Moscow World Standard, which is the MWS, basically. And you're going to see this because it, it's going to become a competing alternative to the LBMA. Now, this is not just about purity and provenance of gold bars, this is, or silver for that matter. It's about setting a benchmark price for at market physical gold and silver, undiluted by flywheel derivative inputs, which is really what the COMEX is providing. And we will look at that in a moment because there's some more confusion, some, actually some confusion at how this will be actually benchmarked. But first let's box off these backwardations. And while we highlight silver in and gold, it, 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 silver in gold, um, which has usually been much more difficult to, uh, to get transparency into, uh, we're seeing actually there's a plain vanilla premium. It looks like it's trading at about 12 bucks higher. But that is accounting for these costs that we're talking about into December. But actually, if you net it all out, it is also in technical backwardation to December. But to really assess this condition, we need to delve uh, much harder in, in, into the much harder to hide footprints in um, silver futures. I mean, really, this is to me, this, this beggars the three questions that I get consistently all the time is, well, how did we arrive at this COMEX divergence is one question. Uh, the next one is, is, how will this massive divergence between the undeliverable paper sold futures deliverable spot get resolved? It has to get at some point. And, and what are the insiders doing? And, and I think it can boil down a lot of questions of that. So, you know, there's a very short answer to, to the first question. Uh, the house run high frequency trading bots are directional and lead the spec neutral algos by the nose. And we've talked about this. Um, we looked in detail in one of our uh, episodes about this, but one influences the other. Now, one is a directional uh, high frequency bot, and the other is it's just really neutral. It takes a tick each side, either side of the market, but it can be led by the nose. And the house can rely on spec algos to tick for tick, uh, ne negatively correlate to strong dollar crosses, which is where we started by explaining how, uh, why automated they do that, which they completely ignore 
uh, the futures to cash market backwardations, hence this issue, and the real backward but physical disconnects, which on the other side of this automated sell program, drive commercials to actually take the long side of each automated sell order. They can just sit there all day long and know that when the dollar ticks up, the speculators will sell. Who's taking that trade? The insiders, the house, of course. And so then if the answer to the second question is, um, is that this algo-driven divergence has created an unprecedented arbitrage opportunity and it's opening the siloed COMEX silver flywheel for delivery outside of the house. Now, silver usually provides us a much more transparent view into the gold market, but since Basel III NSFR standards were imposed on the over-the-counter leg of the COMEX to physical trade, from a wholesale market perspective, it's much more visible. And it's gold that's becoming easier to read. So let's step back from this very, very short-term chart noise to look at the footprints as both of these markets are joined at the hip. So the evidence is there really. If anyone who wants to look, the evidence is there. Since March 2020, uh, since the $12 lows, um, COMEX registered silver stocks have contracted over 40% to currently 15 to 16%. I mean, the lowest registered levels since uh, 2016, 2017, but, but these registered drawdowns have largely migrated straight into the eligible category, which means the silver has not yet left the warehouses. Now that is, uh, that's something that is becoming very attractive when you see these kind of dislocations. However, given the extraordinary embedded, embedded arbitrable backwardations, which last month expanded the discount to spot, I remember at one point it went to $1,400 a contract. And as late as today, with rollover upon us, I mean, th this should not be happening. And with only one session to options expiring tomorrow, the December contract is still averaging a $900 discount to cash silver. This is unprecedented. And it tells us the futures pricing is completely out of whack with the real deliverable cash price. And in other words, this is further confirmation that the COMEX pricing mechanism is broken. And the only traders that don't see this is the siloed blinkered speculators hanging out naked short, oblivious to what's going on outside the casino. It's staggering, but true. And the expiring September contract should by now really be trading at par to cash silver, but it's not. It's trading at a massive 13 to 14 cent. Uh, uh, I mean, this is unbelievable stuff that it would have that much of a divergence because it's just so easy to arbitrage if you're not locked into the casino. So um, now this is going to be imminently called into first notice day, which means paying for a 5,000 ounce silver contract uh, so you have to pay for that in full. So to put that into perspective, it's not just the $7,500 you a spec must put up to trade this contract, but based upon the options bets that they have bet against $20 silver for tomorrow, first notice requires an entire $100,000 per contract to be paid up. Something the naked short speculators who have nothing to deliver are not going to do because they could be called on it. So insiders know that they are going to close these positions or roll them into December. The trouble is, December contract will have speculators completely confused here. From a risk reward perspective, forward selling this contract, which is already valued at a discount to the cash silver price for immediate delivery, it's not very attractive. In fact, it poses a risk of unlimited losses if they are caught holding a bag into a black swan event. So really, the I think that there were, the, the third question I had was, really, what are the insiders doing? The, the insiders clearly are all over this risk-free spec-driven discount. Uh, we see the footprint so blatant. Um, and insiders exposed to the physical market outside of the this outside the siloed world of the casino 
are capitalizing on this specter of discount, which in turn has attracted extremely large unreported Indian and Chinese physical buying, which is straining uh, these 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 non they're still non they're still not NSFR compliant like gold is, but they're still straining the bilaterally settled silver COMEX to over the counter flywheel, which is the EFPs. Now they're you know clearly <laughs> refiners are locking in a higher price here in spot. Why would they, I mean, so in other words, you're now looking at looking at other venues other than the COMEX to hedge these positions. So really, while COMEX silver warehouse receipts have up until now con continued to just shuffle to and across the uh, warehouse blue center line, uh, escaping what is called loadout, which is when you take physical delivery, the resulting COMEX centric generated output price sets at the same time, the over-the-counter silver spot market, which is deliverable. And this is the global spot FX silver price that's being capitalized on outside the casino in the currency markets and by you stackers, no doubt. And currently, algo-driven prices of, um, uh, you know, into available physical supply to meet demand is so tight. I mean, you wouldn't believe it to look at the chart that we'd expect this COMEX stash to actually be EFP'd rapidly, forcing insiders sitting on this flywheel to load out of the warehouse, or one way or the other, or raise the prices quickly. This process is already evident in gold. Yes, you can see some intraday uh, moves, but no, um, it is in strong demand, and the, you're obviously you're not seeing quite the same impact in gold as silver. Now, as we've been reporting ever since Russia sanctioned bolstered very large safe haven physical demand and officials moved to tamp down the gold price. If you remember, uh, we talked about this before, it was at 2080. And by swamping the physical market with a tidal wave of paper gold selling, which really culminated in July at uh, the 1678 level um, into deeply backwardated conditions. And if you remember, we were evidencing $6 spot premiums to, to gold futures. And at that point, over 7 million ounces now, since then, over 7 million ounces have been loaded out of the COMEX warehouse. This is supposed to be a non-delivery market, and yet it is seeing load out. That would never have happened before. And as we've been drawing attention to since January, these bilaterally settled EFPs have now landed into a Basel III NSFR compliant over-the-counter market, and it is still not being grasped by mainstream media and these blinkered specs that this historic paper-to-paper uh, paper EFP process is now turned into a physical backdoor, which is beginning to drain COMEX inventories. That's why we are able to see this now much better in gold than in silver because silver still hasn't left the, the warehouse. So, so just so far in August, <clears throat> while speculators have been taking the short load off the commercial insiders, 3.4 million ounces of gold has been loaded out of the warehouses. Now, while an almost, this is interesting, while an almost identical 3.5 million ounces have been EFP'd during exactly the same period. This is no coincidence. This should have the attention of Bloomberg, Reuters, or any one of the multiple of mainstream media's reporters, reporters that suggest loading, uh, trading in, or trading out of certain assets or stocks. They, they avoid this subject like the plague, and they only ever seem to mention gold on a down day. And you kind of ask yourself, why, why would that be? I mean, really, what, what would the problem be here? So understandably, as a result of this, gold and especially silver investors have become extremely frustrated with the blatant counterintuitive capping of a natural flow of safe haven investment demand into gold and silver that really should evidence both gold and silver rising on the back of a strong physically driven safe haven global demand. Now, if it were not for the officially run COMEX casino, this would be happening. However, there is a price, Shane. Now, Andrew, there seems to be quite an imbalance here. And I guess the question is, 
in the short term, where, where does this imbalance, where is it likely to play out? Yeah, so very short term because we have options and then we have September expiry and of, of silver. The, 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 the December contracts already um, uh, trading in, in, in gold. Um, so what, what's happened is the uh, insiders have been hoodwinked into thinking that uh, they could sell, uh, short sell, um, the options $20 calls. So in other words, what they've done is bet against it um, being closed at that level. So, but the house is on the long side of this. So really dependent on the crosses. So if you see a, a weaker dollar or a stronger dollar, obviously that is going to influence the short short term action, but it's coiling a spring regardless. But obviously as we go into Jackson Hole um, on Friday, um, you know, what it's doing is driving automated selling and buying. So really, it, it, it depends very much if the um, if the dollar is rising or not between that point, And it's certainly seen it hitting uh, 2002 levels of high levels. Um, so we would expect um, the commercials to ring the register on these bets because they are on the long side of the speculator short bets. But so. But on the other hand, what they may do and have done in the past is allow them to roll because these speculators are that blind to the physical markets that they usually when they move into when they uh, come into the money, i.e. they can cash out instead of taking the money. What they do is roll these um, these bets into a short bet and then wait until the last minute to roll out. And we've just said, here's the problem. December doesn't make sense to them because it's it's just below the price of cash. So this is an unusual situation. But in gold, um, same question, really. Um, massive physical support uh, is, is, at the, uh, is ever, uh, at the equivalent 1800 spot level. Now, that, that is obviously, that is counter to the, what the action we're seeing now, because currently that's about 1812, 181250, uh, futures because of the um, because of the carry costs, but again, the, you can just bet you're going to see these guys to completely rinse the speculator bets, and it's probably by way of an air pocket that they will. Uh, when it comes to rollover, uh, nobody's going to take delivery in the COMEX, and so what you can do is you can create these air pockets where you literally know their positions. You stop pulling some bids, so we we would expect that to rise, but. As we've recently been observing, though, there's a strong competing central bank amongst all of this, strong competing central bank and sovereign size physical buyers ready to step in to capitalize on these synthetic discounts. And they are, which is the only thing providing any form of discipline at all to the non-delivery COMEX pricing mechanism. So ultimately, paper prices are convertible into physical through the EFP mechanism. And it, 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 it's this unwanted competing physical demand that is forcing commercials exposed to the physical market to buy back futures to hedge um, uh, physical exposure. So I guess the bottom line of this is just how long can this divergent action continue? Uh, and really, if we want to look at the answer for that, um, you've just got to take off the US centric blinkers designed to uh, block uh, these COMEX participants from from ever taking the larger 360 view, which to every other participant is telegraphing fair value prices that are significantly higher than currently what's on offer in the non-delivery world of the COMEX casino. So by design, um, the global view is hidden from the myopic COMEX participants. Yet under the US centric um, uh, radar, a large unleveraged move into physical gold from all other participants, and, and I mean all other participants, is underway. This includes the same market-making banks operating as official agents um, in the COMEX marketplace to also load up on physical based upon these massively divergent prices. So this fresh move into physical gold and silver is driven by the largest, and in gold particularly, by the largest foreign central bank move into gold since Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. I think people just aren't getting that. And these reported foreign central bank and sovereigns 
are moving to diversify their reserves away from the dollar. And in doing so, they've effectively reopened the gold convertibility window by competitively moving in against each other to load up on a gold price that in their view is hundreds of dollars below where they perceive it is worth against the dollar. Uh, so yet, yet when we look at the published data, it only reflects the volumes that must be reported, which also, which although is way short of reflecting, you know, real, uh, the real picture, already evidences the largest move by competing central banks um, into gold since 1971. So that's just what can be, uh, can be, can be visibly seen. So China and Russia are the really the elephants inside this synthetic price setting room. Um, however, the emerging uh, market central banks have now moved to become some of the largest buyers of gold and also lagging reports of strong Indian wholesale buying, which we talked about last time. Still, they're only they're starting to leach out, but they're not really discussed. And of course, this doesn't affect the close to 90 tons we talked about of smuggle gold per month, uh, feeding this oil uh, for go the gold for oil trade. And none of the uh, of this data captures monetary gold escaping the reporting mechanisms, no nor are direct imports from foreign owned mines reported, all of which contributes to really tightening supply at current dilutive non-delivery prices. And it's the offer to sell real physical that is rising. And it is the attack on paper gold that is draining the necessary liquidity to suck in enough spec supply to offset this move for alchemists, because this is what's going on. These guys are alchemists converting paper gold into physical. And they're thinking anything sub 2000 is huge value. And, and it, in other words, they're looking at backwardated pricing now. And given the size of the move into physical and with physical gold priced synthetically at the margin, each ounce removed from the COMEX price setting mechanism weakens the official mechanism to further control gold pricing. Now, what we're witnessing is an unprecedented move to secure and really lock in. I mean, <laughs> lock in gold uh, at, 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 a, at a fraction of, um, of, what it, of what really it is worth. Um, and if you remember, uh, if we look at, um, you, you remember we talked about uh, the LBMA um, coming out and they were talking about um, they, they admitted in their, in their I think it was the issue 990 of their uh, LBMA um, uh, program. They admitted, uh, yes, the wholesale physical markets are broken due to, quote, ebbing liquidity. Hey, guys, now this is becoming real. I mean, the LBMA were already telegraphing what we're now witnessing, which is a broken but increasingly arbitrage paper market, which when it lands as an EFP in the hands of the over-the-counter liquidity provider must now be Basel III NSFR compliant and physically deliverable. Only the depleting GLD inflows, and they are depleting because when you've got this kind of negative settlement, then, you know, even these guys who are buying GLD when they feel bullish are not entering into those trades, which is actually helpful for us. But even then, GLD is receiving, uh, uh, so GLD is really less of an issue now because it, there's less to flywheel into there. And so I guess what we're saying is the newly weaponized dollar is incentivizing central bank and, and sovereign physical demand and repatriations. And while the formation of the BRICS currency basket, <laughs> I mean, trade wars, negative interest rates, um, uh, comparative bubble territory with sentiment, uh, pushing up against undeliverable bubble territory, short gold and silver positions, even th there are reasons enough to take the gloves off anyway. And the gold and silver price reset clearly under the radar of this absolute bastardized action that we're seeing is undoubtedly not far away. And this is not the time, certainly to be short, safe havens of any kind, let alone, let, let, alone, let alone gold. So this leads perfectly into the Russian finance ministry announced its plan to create its own international standard for precious metals market. And as we say, it's called the MWS. And it will become, 
a competing alternative to the LBMA. And as I say, not just about purity and provenance. This is a going to set a benchmark price outside of this LBMA cesspit. And Basel III is all well and good, but we're seeing COMEX gold EFP'd into this Basel III compliant over the counter market. But the non compliant GLD flywheel is still infested with, even though it's reduced, it's infested with siloed COMEX centric paper market actors who continue to unload their positions from that side of things. Some are neutral, but some are predatory. Fascinating uh, times, Andrew. I want to come back to Russia just for a second here. And I know you've done a lot of research on this new uh, Russian uh, benchmark that, that, that will be priced. Can you, can you share your thoughts on, on the benchmark? Yeah, really, really important and, and, and not to be un underestimated. And I'm sure a lot of the mainstream media would just poo-poo it and say, well, it's a long time away. It's not. Um, from my own research, and, and we speak to a lot of people uh, close to this market, the quoted benchmark reference, um, we saw a, a quoted rent re reference price uh, in an article, I think it mentioned 5,000 rubles per ounce, uh, which was a benchmark that has since been changed to a flexible, more equitable uh, wholesale market exchange rate for the ruble gold. But the 5,000 ruble per gram benchmark, when it was launched, sucked hundreds of tons of physical gold into the Russian central bank's coffers. And it stick saved the ruble and if you remember, it strengthened it from the initial uh, sanction reaction um, uh, when it was 121 um, uh, to, to, to on the 7th of March to 75 to 1 by the, by the time really by, um, sorry, it was 75 to 1 in February and it, it spiked up to 121 on the 7th of March, right? So... But then we saw everyone coming out and talking about, you know, there was Biden came out and he talked about the rubble state, the ruble to rubble statement, how that immediately backfired. And it was gold that made it backfire. Russia had anticipate sanction, has anticipated these sanctions and immediately implemented dis, this discounted oil for gold trade, which drove hundreds of tons of physical gold into Russian central bank coffers. Guess what price? at COMEX derived prices, turning the ruble into the strongest gold backed foreign exchange currency bar none. And that is true now. And since then, while Russia has leveraged sanctions to their own advantage, all the sanctioning countries except the US have been sucked into an ill-conceived sanction driven economic death spiral. Out of necessity, we actually expect Europe to kick back against these US centric sanctions as we head into winter and uh, you, people have to make the choice between eating or heating. Now, the proxy and proof of this sanction backfire is right there in the foreign exchange cross. You can't mess with it. Uh, this is a global foreign exchange price. They would love it to be rubble, but it's not. Um, so really, when you weigh up uh, the sanctioning, uh, when you weigh up the currencies, the sanctioning countries versus the ruble, you only need to look at the ruble dollar or the, ru and the, or the ruble uh, the ruble gold price at exchange rates, the ruble has strengthened to around 58 to 1 against the dollar. That's a level not seen in seven years. Now, and we'll look at the current gold price correlations to the ruble in, in a moment, but directly after this fixed 5,000 ruble per gram price was formally locked in, a panicking paper centric gold cartel laden with undeliverable short delivery uh, deliverable bets against gold made the connection that paper price gold price in dollars was grossly undervalued and accordingly the ruble strengthening so rapidly within just one month russia's central bank was able to milk gold out of the cme lbma ring fenced paper markets at a far better bilaterally negotiated ruble price formally benchmarking what was a floating, uh, benchmarking a floating better, pro, um, better price for themselves, priced in physical gold um, with the friendly BRICS countries. Now, this included the Indian gold for oil trade, which has since sanctions uh, were implemented in March, it's tripled. Smuggling from the world, you know, when the world, you measure the World Gold Council's estimates of 30 tons per month, moving to closer to 90 tons per month, Indian smuggled gold stays off the radar, but it nevertheless sucks out global supply, further tightening the global physical market um, uh, supply. Now, this brings us to the effect 
this unlimited offer to purchase bullion priced in dollars imposed on the ring fence CME uh, COMEX alliance. Now, currently, this offer, Russian offer to buy, floats at around 20 bucks, consistently 20, sometimes 30, but around 20 bucks above the LBMA benchmark price. Why? Because they're sucking this bullion out. However, this unlimited central bank offer to purchase gold is only constrained by what can actually be physically purchased from the global markets and physically delivered to the Russian central bank. So the, there's obviously a limit to what people want to sell. So this is being flywheeled out of the paper markets, but I can tell you there's a lot, I don't know any physical uh, owner right now that wants to sell their physical gold at these kind of prices or any silver owner that wants to sell their silver at these current prices. And what's not been factored in by the spec-driven COMEX-centric paper market is that the evaporating supply of bullion backing each unbacked casino chip they bet short, there's nothing there. The bullion underpinning these bets is on a one-way trip out of the COMEX by way of a large EFP flows that we witness every single day and have proven evidence of. So the automated paper-centric structure of the COMEX market it blinkers the specs to the fundamental drivers and that are really incentivizing the market makers, which is the house, supplying the shorts to the specs to take the long side of each bet. So remember that uh, the risk lays with the specs when the commercial in insiders do finally ring the register, which they will. It will set up a bid only market that likely forces a series of upside market halts. Now, as we've warned, um, Following U.S. traders being banned from trading foreign exchange over the counter gold and silver back in 2013, they were siloed, to, as you say, to trade inside this casino. So problem with that is that a little advertised CME rule favors the market making COMEX liquidity providers who, during, as we've talked about this, being we warned about this and drew attention to it, there could be a five minute futures market halt and a three minute options market halt. But the market makers can still provide liquidity to the over-the-counter markets and you know what they're doing on while those markets are frozen. So this opens up the short speculators to massive unfactored tail risk. And as we've also warned, this potentially exposes naked short sellers to unlimited losses more than they have bet. And the, mar the March 2020 EFP blow up that exposed the market making liquidity providers to hundreds of millions of losses is why they've made sure they are not exposed to the another bid only market. And some pulled out of providing liquidity, the rest have become Basel III NSFR compliant. So insiders, that's the commercials and even officials exposed to the Basel III compliant over the counter markets, where these EFPs land for bid delivery are making sure they're on the long side of every single naked short speculator held bet. So the drain of bullion under the spec mainstream media uh, dependent radar it is is unfathomable and it beggars the question really to, to what extent have the russia driven comex outflows broken through the cme lbma ring fets and and where is all this physical gold finally ending up guys wow andrew that's amazing uh, what are, what are you seeing there yes shane um to sum up where it's going um surplus russian central bank Physical gold, which exceeds what is held by the central bank to maintain this balanced, strong, stable ruble uh, US dollar cross and ruble euro cross, is being exchanged for rubles with China. So this bullion, excess bullion, goes to China and the ruble, they pay for it in rubles. It's a win-win for the these two allied, uh, two largest global physical gold countries. And it's this condition that is that has led into last week's Russian finance ministry announcing its plan to create its own international standard competing with the LBMA. And I mean, really estimates vary as to what extent um, Russia-driven COMEX outflows have broken through already the CME LBMA ring fates, but we've just evidenced the, the millions of ounces that have exited by way of EFPs. Um, what it does is evidence that global supply is actually becoming very, very tight at current prices. So the Russia-China alliance breach of this CME-LBMA ring fence 
is really the subject that we're really focusing on. And really since Basel III NSFR compliance in January, it is this COMEX Achilles heel that's being tapped into using their own EFP mechanism. And this, this the irony is that this very same tool uh, to play a paper to paper game, uh, game batting the COMEX uh, paper into paper over the counter markets that could be eternally rolled into 14 day less forwards. We talked about these before where it was quite legitimate to keep rolling them into, into never, never the land. Um, it's what these are the ones that they bring down the house now. And EFPs are now being utilized to tap COMEX price gold into a wide open Basel III compliant funnel. And it's just not being realized by every, anyone, uh, but by really speculators. And certainly the market makers know what's happening. And so up until the West drove Russia into backing the ruble with gold, paper to physical alchemy was already well underway. And we talked about this before. I mean, China alone has already accumulated at least 25,000, 30,000 tons of physical gold uh, that's salted amongst its state held banks. And, and Russia has only been exchanging, I mean, treasuries for gold in, until they, they really had no treasuries left. And since the sanction driven oil for gold trade commenced six months ago in March, is I think the anniversary of it today, um, um, it really a best estimate, including the noted Indian gold arbitrage trade around probably at least a thousand tons, over a thousand tons of gold has likely been alchemized but not reported, creating a massive short goal in what the World Gold Council's supply demand estimates assess. Now, bearing in mind, these estimates govern a lot of the algo derivative inputs, which can offset such drivers as a strong dollar index, influence in how that influences over uh, gold futures, et cetera. Now, if we add in Russian central bank reserves, these two allied central bank holdings dwarf rehypothecated US and Western Central Bank uh, holdings. Now, this is one of the drivers that is driving uh, the BIS to, and we've talked about this last time, to exit its paper lease swap liabilities. So bottom line, gold and silver prices must rise or the non-delivery uh, COMEX uh, swamp, <laughs> there's no other word for it, is gonna get drained. And again, how we always say this, we always end with this, the only question remaining is how much physical do you own? All right. And with that, thank you so much, Andrew McGuire and Talking Gold. And remember to our entire Live from the Vault community, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button, by sharing it with everyone you know, and especially subscribing. And if you want to be notified in real time as each episode goes live, just click, click on that little bell there and you'll be notified. With that, we'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then. <laughs>